So, you know, I guess we jump into the company a little bit. Um, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, I developed an app with uh, my college roommate and mm -hmm. it automates Wi-Fi connectivity. Um, so what does that mean? Well, I found while traveling that it is very dangerous if you didn't have connectivity in some areas, some places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also found that having connectivity ultimately enhanced my my like time anywhere. Um, not having connectivity, really hard to meet up with people that I just met that want to like meet up for drinks or for dinner. And then I have to like go and like find some Wi-Fi real fast and be like, hey guys, I'm running late because like I'm brand new to whatever town I'm in. And like, uh, how about 8.30? You know, like you don't make it, you know, you miss on so much opportunity when you're not connected. And it's about my, my company, my app, providing connectivity with Wi-Fi, right? For everybody anywhere. Um, while they're traveling on the go is so that you can live this nomadic lifestyle, but still yeah. have the survivability aspects that you're used to where you're from, like, you know, navigation, um, communicating connectivity in general with anything that it, that it enhances. So how ubiquitous is Wi-Fi in a foreign country or just in general, right? So I'm just trying to understand the scope of your app. So like if I'm in a foreign country and I have your app, is it fair to say that I'd have Wi-Fi connect? If I'm in a major city, Wi-Fi connectivity in most places just by bouncing from like public hotspot to hotspot? Yeah, sort of. So we do crowdsourcing. Um, that's our network is is crowdsourcing. We ensure that the Wi-Fi is you know, it's real, it's that location's actual Wi-Fi, it doesn't move, so it's like not a bad actor. Um, we also allow for auto connectivity with Android. Um, iOS is pretty dang close to auto connection, but I mean, they definitely don't allow for it all the way, so you still have to click mm -hmm. and connect. Um, but the idea is that it's crowdsourced. So, you know, right now, as we say, no, whatever CEO2 is not going to have it. The idea of going to Medellin, Colombia is, you know, I'm going to go there and I had lived there for about two and a half months. Um, I loved it. I had a great time. I partied way too much though. So this time mm -hmm. we're not going to party as much, but we're going to build out the actual Wi-Fi infrastructure there. Um, mapping all the Wi-Fis, working with local businesses, um, you know, getting, um, having them show like our symbol of our company is called verify. So mm -hmm. that's spelled like Wi-Fi. So V E R I F I, right? Like verify. Okay. Wi-Fi. Yeah. We're verifying the existence of Wi-Fi. You know, we hope that one day you'll associate the Wi-Fi button with the idea of verify on your phone. Um, and we are going to go and build out the city. So if you are a digital nomad or a traveler or even a local, and we've looked at, you know, Medellin and a lot of people I was dating a girl there for a little bit you know she didn't have a phone plan and mm -hmm. like she's poor like she worked a good job she's smart she's a student um right like she just didn't want to pay for a phone plan it's just too expensive mm -hmm. um right and and the data plans were really expensive and to get a sim card was complicated in, in a, a little bit because you had to fill the sim card up with like data so like I had to get a sim card then like buy data for that SIM card and also ensure that I turn it on. And I had to like call a company to turn on the card, right? And they, if you don't speak Spanish, this gets even more difficult. Um, so there's like so many obstructions to just getting yeah. connectivity, right? And it's important to have connectivity in Medellin. It's a, it's a good city. It's a great city, but I'm not going to necessarily say that it's super safe. Um, like when I was there, one of the guys um, from the United States was found dead in a dumpster like that i had Jeez. met a day prior like i met this yeah. guy day prior. I'm, I'm not going to say his name because it's a podcast but you know a buddy of mine when we're at a rooftop hostel he's like hey there's another guy from the u.s says his name i'm like yeah what's up man he's like oh i'm from la I'm like, oh that's cool man and he's like yeah dude like and he's like 27 28 same age as me i, I read it yeah. in the newspaper in the article and I was like, yeah, man, we're all going to go out tonight. Like, you're cool. You're from the U.S. Like, you should come with us. And he was like, yeah, I actually have a date. And I was like, okay. I looked at him like he's not very attractive. 5'8", not an attractive guy in general. I'm just not trying yeah. to talk. But I'm like, all right, man, you have fun on your date. And, you know, I should have been like, man, like people out here 
are really attractive on Tinder and social media apps and they get you to go on dates with them or to meet up with them where you're from and they rob you. I should have been like, I knew that was a thing, like traveling. Yeah, right? yeah. I should have probably, I, I mean, I thought about this. Like I should have been like, hey man, like who are you going out with? And like looked at her and been like, like I saw the picture of the girl because they found her out who killed him. And like, she's way too attractive for him. Like I'm just not trying to be yeah. rude. Like, no, there's yeah, the reality like, that that sucks. Yeah, I mean, shoulda, woulda, coulda, and I feel bad about it. And, you know, like, you're not thinking in the moment. You know, Who knows, man? But it, one of my whole point is that traveling is dangerous. You yeah. know, like, they found him dead the next day, and I just met him, like, that night before he died. And I'm like, you know, it's a crazy world. Um, so connectivity is important, and staying connected, and, like, you know, stuff went wrong when I was in Colombia. I got drugged um, when I was out. A friend of mine just got drugged and robbed who's supposed to be my business liaison in Medellin. But like these, uh, these things, they're, they're like this week he got drugged and robbed. Um, and what, what do you mean drug? Do you know? Like with what? Like, was it? Cause yeah, I hear about it. Yeah. Sculpamine. I've heard about that at Columbia, Columbia. Yeah. They just got to breathe it in your face, man. They just got to breathe it in your face or put so it in your So how common train. is that? I mean, cause I've seen documentaries about that it looks sketch, but you know, like, is it really that bad? But I mean, that's crazy if that happened to you. Yeah. I mean, this is the importance of like traveling in groups or with people and you can mm -hmm. relatively trust travelers. I'm not saying like trust yeah. them with your life. Like In some regards you are, when you travel as a pack, right? Like you are traveling. I, I mean, I got scopamine when I was at the club and my friend Ikra from the UK, she saw this guy like I like fell over a little bit and he like grabbed me and he was like, all right. And he was like walking me out of the club, man. Like mm -hmm. I am not, I was not there. Right. And my really tall six foot five guy, friend of mine from uh, Romania, he like, she gets him and some other guys and they like come and like, they get me, man, from this guy walking me out of the club, clearly going to probably rob me or something. Yeah. Um, and they like take me, yeah. They like take me back to my apartment that I was renting in Medellin and like, thank God, like someone was looking out for me, but like, yeah, that's, that's a normal thing. Like, you, but that's why you travel with people looking out for you and like why yeah. connecting people and staying connected and having, you know, some form of, because travel is amazing, but there's always going to be people that take advantage of travelers. And if I was yeah. there for two and a half months, man, like something bad's bound to happen just this, statistically speaking when I'm not from there. And you know, this was in most places that I stayed for a long time, something bad did happen. But like, I didn't die, and the world isn't as dangerous or evil as you think it is, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. So I want to go back to like what your goals are in Medellin and where you are in the company. Like, does the app exist today, or is Medellin kind of the first launch, and then it will be for people that live there, and it will be kind of your beta test group, and then you expand it from there? I'm just trying to think, you know, more yeah. into the future of what the plan is. Yeah, so if you're my competitor, and I see you up there, um, here's the plan. Uh, so, yeah, you know, we got some competitors. So, um, we're going to, our first launch is going to be Medellin. Um, we're going to launch the app. We can put it on the store in about the next week or two. Um, so, actually, when this goes live, hopefully the app is on the store. Um, is that so like we'll, Google Play and the App Store? Is that okay? Yeah. So, it's going to look like a ghost town, though. So I already mm -hmm. know right now, like there's going to be a lot, like, the majority of the world will not be mapped with Wi-Fi. It allows for the capacity for the mapping of Wi-Fi everywhere. Um, that is what we are first allowing. Now we have mechanisms of building the network. Um, we're going to be using local rapid drivers, which is like the Uber Eats of Medellin. Um, mm -hmm. Huge rap, huge app called Rappi. Um, mm -hmm. Great app, by the way. It's like the Uber Eats of America, but for South America. And so gotcha. we are going to be linking up with a bunch of rapid drivers and these guys are going to be going around and adding the first thousand plus Wi-Fi's, right? We're going to be paying them. They already have a form of electronic payment, which is a great way that we're like, oh, they already work for an app. They get, they get paid, you know, online. So we could just pay them to map the Wi-Fi's for the first thousand. Well, um, really quick though. What do you yeah. mean map the Wi-Fi? Like, so are they going to local businesses and asking them like, hey, can we just, because you said it's crowdsourced. So they go to a coffee shop. They mm -hmm. say, hey, can we add your router or whatever it is to verify? Is that how it works? What do you mean by mapping? 
Oh yeah. Sorry. So, um, yeah, I mean, ideally they ask for permission. Um, oh, okay. that's, that's the ideal, right? So, um, the Wi-Fi, th but this is something that you have to think about it at scale, right? Like, um, you know that, you know, let's just say that this is, you know, Connor Wi-Fi, Connor Cafe, and the mm -hmm. Wi-Fi name is Connor Coffee, right? Mm -hmm. and the password is Connor is amazing. And so mm -hmm. all you got to know is that we know that Connor Cafe and Connor Wi-Fi, those are, um, you know, that's the location and that's the name of the Wi-Fi. You, the user, can type in Connor is amazing, right? That's the password. Now you connect as Connor, right? Um, and now your Wi-Fi is, is able to be connected by anybody in the world. Now, when I enter Conf Connor's cafe, if I immediately connect to this Wi-Fi, then I validate that it actually does exist and does work, and it is the correct password. So... It's like a, it's like a proof of yeah. work model. Yeah. It's interesting. So I guess just to clarify, you're saying someone goes into the cafe, they log in, they also have the verify app and then it therefore proves the password. And then anybody else that is in the vicinity of that Wi-Fi walks in, they automatically connect. Yeah, kinda. exactly. And is there any, you, would that be frowned upon by businesses or maybe it's uh, in someone's home or do they not even know that other people are on their Wi-Fi without the <laughs> So we're not doing homes. Um, okay. Let that be known for all the legal. If there's a lawyer like seven years from now, I'm in front of a judge. <laughs> well, he said it, right? Like he, he effing said yeah, it. Yeah, not, yeah. not doing homes. We're not doing homes. We're doing places of business, right? Mm -hmm. And we are assuming that you are a good actor, a good faith actor, right? So we are assuming that you're a customer, right? Or you want to be a prospective customer because a lot of the ways it's like, you know, we assume if you're in that establishment that you're on that Wi-Fi so that, you know, um, mm -hmm. you're going to buy a coffee, a Connor's coffee, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That makes sense. If I stop in there cause I'm a traveler who's lost, you know, and I connect to the Wi-Fi, I think they're actually more inclined if they use the Wi-Fi and they connect to it to be like, Hey, like I just benefited from this Wi-Fi. Maybe I should buy a coffee. So especially if the app is showing that there's a good, like, cause we can t tell you how fast it is by the way. Um, so we can start to attract people to go to cafes that never maybe would go to, to work from for like remote working because they have a great upload download time, right? There's the speed test says that it has, you know, it's a hundred megabytes per second and like, mm -hmm. that's great. So like there's a lot of other ways and attractive ways that businesses might want their Wi-Fi to be on this network, right? Um, because while you're traveling, especially me, right, when I'm working while traveling, digital nomads who work while traveling, they kind of want to be able to, you know, do some work. And there's nothing worse than like having intermittent connecting, you know, uh, Wi-Fi or mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, you, 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 uh, you're downloading or uploading a YouTube video because like you're a content creator and like yeah. you're an influencer, whatever it is, right? And like imagine you're on YouTube and you're uploading your like one hour video, right? And like you're traveling and you're, you're a YouTuber that travels and then like the Wi-Fi cuts off and like maybe you lose that video. Like that suck, man. Like mm -hmm. there's so many different ways of, of approaching like why you want to have good, reliable connectivity and Wi-Fi. And that's like what we – hope to um give as a product um to show people where it is to auto connect them and to you know help businesses as well um connect with yeah. people because of the service they give and i think that makes sense i didn't really think of it in that regard where it's like hey this attracts customers to businesses so it's it's a win-win really and then i'm curious is the goal eventually to kind of have this replace a cell phone service i mean is it possible for someone to be walking down the street in Medellin and have blanket Wi-Fi coverage because they're within a certain radius of a hotspot over here at this business and this business? Or is it truly like, hey, you're going to have to go sit at this coffee shop, but you're going to connect automatically. It's going to be super fast. And that's kind of the utility of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, so it really comes down to the conversation that society wants to have with their government right like 
we could and you can be the like verify and we have ideas about extending connectivity. But if I told you, like, let's say I, I use Raleigh as an example, Raleigh, North Carolina. So mm-hmm. Raleigh has a certain amount of traffic in and out of Raleigh every day. The city of Raleigh probably should, and, and most cities in general should, have public Wi-Fi so that they know that Connor, I don't know where you're from, Connor, by the way, maybe California. Um, yeah. But let's say that Connor from California is in Raleigh. Like, they should know, like, okay, there's a bunch of guys coming from California to Raleigh. Now, this doesn't mean that, like, we, we aren't in the data selling business at Verify, right? Like, we have nothing set up for that. And we haven't thought too much about the, how the privacy in regards to the data side, how we want it. We definitely know, okay, well, it's secure. It will handle it correctly. And like, we just don't have any sale set up or anything like that. But if I was a government and I wanted to know who's coming as a tourist to my city, mm-hmm. why, why would I want to know that? Well, I'm going to ask you, like, why would I want to know who comes to my city? So you'd know how to increase spending or commerce within the city and therefore increase tax revenue and provide better services to your citizens and be able to reinvest. You want a thriving city. You don't want a city that nobody's coming to. So whatever insights you can glean from that should benefit you. Right. So when you look at like when you land in another country's airport, that government owns that Wi-Fi. I 100% know it. Mm. The government's paying for that connectivity. So you land in Medellin, Colombia, free Wi-Fi. Why? Because they want to know where the hell you're coming from. They want to know you. I have an American phone number and I landed in Medellin. Now, they mm. don't get much more information about me. They don't know where I'm going or where I go to in Medellin, right? But they know that an American landed in Medellin. Now, if I was running Raleigh, for example, or Medellin, it doesn't matter. I would look at well, where's everyone going in the city? There's wear and tear that's going to happen, infrastructure that's going to get worn down. But also we should invest in developing and helping these areas support this tourism. I don't know if you've ever been to Italy recently, but that place is shutting down when it comes to infrastructure because of how many people, how, how much people are traveling there, right? Yeah. Like, they're wearing down the streets there. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, it's like packs and packs and packs of people. And I bet Italy is just like over, like, how do we overhaul this? And like, how do we handle like this much tourism? And like, it, it, this is diminishing the, the life and the value of the people of our own citizens, right? Like there's people mm-hmm. with concerns, you know, like I was in Greece and, and, and I was living in um, kind of like the, the revolting neighborhood, um, Exarchia. And I will not yeah. be able to say it the way that, you know, um, the Greeks say it, exarchia, exarchia, or I can't say it. But <laughs> yeah. I lived there for a few months, for two months, right? And this was like in a famous movie uh, that I watched that like, this is like where the people revolted from, like in the movie and like where all the, you know, the, um, the young youth and rebels were. So I was like, I'm going to live there. Not a little dangerous, but there were some riots that went on when I was there. It could have got bad for me, but why why what do they talk about and when i was in this neighborhood what i learned was that like greeks you know there's so much tourism going on there's so much infrastructure problems they when i was living there they destroyed one of the most beautiful parks just like little kids playing in the park and like and like Mm -hmm. older people watching them and like playing music and like it was beautiful this park right they broke this park down to become a subway station when i was there that caused a huge riot. There was police everywhere. I have videos of like, you know, like the police like banging on their their stuff and like people throwing rocks at them and stuff. And I'm like, yo, and my door got spray painted, burn Airbnbs. Like, okay. and like, and like the, the A, the A in the circle, which is like a, and the, the local, the, the Greeks every night would meet in this, like uh, this bar on my street, like two streets down, they would meet there and I ended up becoming friends with them because I would go to this like local bar there and like they found out not to hate me that I wasn't trying to like be yeah. a digital note trying to replace them or push them out or you know I was really trying to learn about them right and, and about like what they're mad about and what I found out was is that you know 
they're driving the price. Airbnb is driving the price of, you know, their, their rent. Um, they mm-hmm. can't afford because of how the government's dealing with this, a lot of tourism. Um, a lot of people are making a lot of money and, and forcing them out of the city, right? It's like how we think of gentrification in a lot of ways. Um, and this is happening in, in, in mass um, all over yeah. Greece. And, and Greece is trying to, at the same time, you know, they joined the, the, U, the UN, the European Union, I mean, and uh, that required them to stop building their own products. They had to import a bunch of stuff. So like they're like 70% of their economies like revolving around tourism. Now, what does this matter? Well, there's so much information that the government can glean from and, and prepare and help their citizens enjoy their lives and, and build off the information of who's coming and, and where they're coming from and help the, to invest in to, and to ensure to handle tourism because people want to still see Greek culture. It's, it's classic. It's 2000 plus yeah. years, you know, 5,000, 5, years old, who knows, right? They want to see this culture and, and the Greeks are proud of it and they should be because, you know, humanity was, was basically formed a lot of ways in modern society around them and obviously the Egyptians as well, but like, then they have something to show to the world, right? But, Mm -hmm. you know, connectivity wise, who's coming here, tourism, right? They need to help combat these, this, this um, destruction of their infrastructure. And a lot of that can be gleaned if like there was Wi-Fi everywhere. Um, They would know where people are going. Um, This isn't about tracking people. This isn't about like third party data to know about like what Connor does when he's in Athens so that I can track but it's about like what roads are being over trafficked how many people are you know using these roadways um where's the densest populations happening at right um like it, it just helps a lot and so they can invest economically speaking and develop these areas to be able to handle this much tourism and also they might just say hey look we have like way too many people buying flights in the greece like we're gonna like raise the flight price because they probably can, um, and we're gonna raise the price to come to Greece, and like we're going to do mm-hmm. a lot of other mechanisms to make the livelihood for those in Athens better. And like this, this does happen, and I think that if governments wanted to provide people with Wi-Fi and internet everywhere, I think it's that's one of the things that they can do is they can help with where tourism's coming, what what, what traffic you know is happening where. Um, where to invest economically speaking and develop um, for government, you know, bids and projects um, and to just help the better the lifestyle of those in these areas. Um, and I think that that can be gleaned a lot by who's coming and where they're going. And that's it. Like nothing else, not not like what you Google or anything else, but just like who they are and where they're from. And but uh, yeah, I guess what would you say to people that say that you are you're kind of opening it up to governments who can be bad actors in certain examples and saying, Hey, you're putting it into their hands to take it beyond tourism and, and tracking locations, et cetera. Like how do you keep it to just beneficial uses? Right. Um, I mean, I'm in charge of the company, so true. True. Um, right. Like there's, <laughs> there is like, uh, my, my buddy and I, we both have altruistic, um, goals like we we want to have affordability when it comes to connectivity i have a f- pretty pretty sound belief that hey look we pay for a phone bill you pay for a phone and a phone bill i then have all my data sold by google and amazon and whoever else in facebook to get targeted ads to buy more things but i gotta pay to just be tracked and, and then all my stuff gets sold you know, like mm-hmm. I'm literally yeah. paying into a structure that is just not inherently good for me. Like, why yeah. should my why should I pay to basically have all my stuff stolen from me? I'm paying to get robbed, right, of my data. Yeah, like that's ridiculous. Um, I would like to have the cheapest possible, if if not free, form of connectivity because I need it. I need connectivity to to navigate because I don't have a map in my brain. Right, and we're not going to go back to printing maps and holding them up like this. You know, you know, your dad on a road trip, you know, like, oh, we're going that way, right? Like, that—that's yeah. never coming back. You know, like, Definitely. navigation is 
you know, we need to navigate. We need to be able to communicate. Like my mom, if she needs to get a hold of me, needs to be able to talk to me on the phone. You know, like because God forbid she's gonna freak out if and stress and her cortisol levels are gonna fly if I don't answer. <laughs> right. So, and we don't want bad health from my mom, right? So, like, we want to do the right thing, and so, like, I think connectivity is something that is just inherently should be cheaper. And mm -hmm. obviously we're going to have a paid model, right? Cause we have to support ourselves, and we don't want to have to the, be like, Oh, let's go sell everyone's data and figure out how to do that stuff. Right. So like we want a paid model, obviously. So we're going to give free connectivity for, you know, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 uses a month. Uh, we don't know that yet. We have to AB test it and figure out, okay, well, how many times does someone connect the day? we want to give them an actual good experience. So like, let's give them like 50 connections, you know, like if they're mm -hmm. using it a lot, because we want you to think our app is useful because if I provide value to you, you might think mm -hmm. I might be worth something if I provide you with some value. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, the pro model, we want to build a VPN, a virtual private network. Um, we want you to, um, you know, not be tracked. Basically a VPN helps you not get tracked. Mm -hmm. Um, helps you keep your data. Right. Um, protected. We want to be able to um, provide you with better services, right? So there'll be a paid model as well. Um, we're going to parity price it. So like, you know, it's, we're going to allow for locals in Colombia to be able to afford it. And then people that are from America, maybe have to pay two extra bucks. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Like, inherently you make five times the amount more money than the Colombians. So um, mm -hmm. you're not paying a tax. You're just paying what the parity prices is. Like when I was in Brazil, I think the Netflix was like, five dollars or something if i paid brazilian prices but they, netflix didn't let me pay brazilian prices i had to pay yeah, like yeah. american like 14 15 dollar prices because i'm american and that's what you got to do so we have a we have a parity pricing model as well but we hope that you know local colombians will find it valuable um i can tell you right now when i was dating a girl and she wanted to you know get a hold of me She's like, hey, Ian, like, I'm leaving my house. I'll talk to you in 30 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Okay, 30. And she's like, yeah, just look for me in 30 minutes. And then she messaged me. And I'm like, okay, hey, what's up? She's like, hey, okay, um, I'll be outside your house in about one hour. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like sitting there. I'm like waiting for the text me. I'm like, she's not texting. So I go outside. She's just waiting there. And I'm like, hey. Uh, <laughs> she's like, oh, sorry, I didn't have connectivity. I would have texted you. Yeah. But I told you yeah, in one yeah. hour I'll be outside your house, right? Mm -hmm. This is normal. Um, many people are used to going Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi, uh, locals, right? And so just imagine enhancing just that experience by having free connectivity. And if they find it valuable, pay a few bucks. Um, cool. Yeah. So I'm curious of the monetization strategy. Is it purely just that pro version of it that will be a monthly subscription or whatever you decide? And then is yeah. there are there other channel revenue channels like for the free version? Is there, are there other ways you could make money on it? Yeah. I work with businesses, right? Like, um, promoting businesses. Um, right. Like, so like, let's just say we want to get after digital nomads unless they get after, I'm sorry, I'm not hunting you guys down. Um, we want yeah. to have digital nomads and travelers and people use our app, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. that is that our target market, right? Specifically young digital nomads. We also want them to know that they're helping other travelers because they are. And they add Wi-Fi's mm -hmm. and help out, right? Travelers helping travelers, right? They they are doing that, um, and they're also helping locals um, because we want to work with local businesses and we want to help attract people to those businesses, right? Like I, I'll give you a great example: when you travel to Medellin, you're going to go on the Communa 13. Um, that's like a really cool place. That was like one of the poorest areas and during pablo escobar's time um it was like very gang related and they're like was a huge fight with the government there and now it's like super trendy hipster um it's like up in the mountains and it's amazing i, yeah. I think the greatest rap i've ever seen live like rap there um mm. amazing talent amazing artistry just like and they, they've turned that entire place around in the past 20 years right mm -hmm. so you're gonna go there um you're gonna go out in provenza and it's like a really cool like party dance place you know everyone has like the clubs there and stuff um you're gonna go to provenza you might be in manila which is a smaller neighborhood and it's cool um but like you might not go out to the smaller neighborhoods you know that you don't know about because right you just don't know um 
but if there's connectivity there, if like there's a there's Wi-Fi, um, we, we can help support bringing people to like these other neighborhoods. Then you know that is a way to help the local community, right? Like there's a great coffee shop, right? And and this is the thing that that I know for a fact with people that remote work, they want to remote work at different places all the time. Mm -hmm. um, they don't want the same place is cool, but like they like to switch it up. They can't trust to take their you know, phone calls or their work at other places or to connect if they have bad Wi-Fi. So yeah. they're not going to branch out too often, right? But if I know that in this neighborhood, there's a cute, I, I looked up the, 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 the images of it. It looks like it's a really cute coffee shop. It has, you know, it has really cool reviews, but I can't read anything about the Wi-Fi. Well, we can help either attract them there um, by, you know, showing how good the connectivity is by, you know, doing some sort of, uh, you know, like showing that showcasing them um, with like connectivity and, and reviews and, and pictures and whatever else on the app itself and drive people to you know, maybe go and try to having coffee there at local businesses. And this doesn't have mm -hmm. to be limited to just coffee and digital work or whatever else. Um, there's a lot of yeah. ways we do B2B, B2C. Um, but, you know, we're, this is our beta. Medellin is our beta. Um, we've spent a lot of money with, with building the app itself and we're just going to go see how this works and i'll you will be if you ever go to medellin in the next three months you will find yeah. me at rooftops doing this talking about my app and getting people to download it and telling them about my story and drinking with them and then you know showing them around the city from day to day and going to local businesses and telling them about my app and being like hey we're verify this is our yeah. qr code put this you know on your door put this at the hostel put this on your window when you have our logo it means that your wi-fi is verified you know that like it's good to use um, we want to be the verification you know like if you see this logo you know that like it will have wi-fi on the app you know it's just in inherently um you know not triggering but like you know showing you that we have the the wi-fi so um we want to connect people i it's yeah. part of my it's my story it's part of my stuff Right. That like, you know, we want to connect people. So um, that's kind of the goal of Verify in general um, no. is to, to bring people together. I think it's super cool. So how would you what metrics would you consider Medellin a success? Are you trying to get to a certain number of users in a certain amount of time? And then at that point, move on to the next city. How are you thinking about that? Yeah. So I think like in general with Medellin, we are looking at, can we get X amount of users? I don't really want to say all the stats out there, okay. but let's just yeah. say we want X amount of users. Um, we want to see some retention of locals there. So we want to see that locals actually like to use the app. Um, we want to see, we want to connect to local businesses. I really want to know how local businesses want to interact with this because I really do think that, you know, everyone in technology, I, I, I think they're so far away from the human experience. I think that, you know, Facebook and, and Instagram and all these things are so big and broad and like they just don't connect with the actual company. Like what if Yelp mm -hmm. like actually cared about like <laughs> they like went and like talked to like the companies represented underneath Yelp, right? Like mm -hmm. I care about what people think. I care about what the businesses think. I want to know, you know, what they're, how they would use this app. And you know what? We do allow them if they say we don't want your Wi-Fi on the app, well, they, they can take it off. Like we have a way yeah. for them to submit a form, prove that they're actually the owner of that company and we'll take off the Wi-Fi. And yeah. I, I just certainly would tell them that like, hey, look, here's some FAQs, like here's some frequent questions, here's some answers. If you decide to take off, you know, the Wi-Fi, you know, there's there if this gets this this takes off, like this would maybe hurt you um and not be better. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good point. And then I'm curious too, as much as you're willing to share, like if you look five years down the line, where do you want Verify to be? Yeah. Um, so five years down the line, I hope that we are the app symbol. Like when you think of like Wi-Fi, you think mm -hmm. of Verify. Like you don't you don't think of asking for the Wi-Fi. Um, you know, it's just a part of the app. You don't think about Wi-Fi. Like, I, I just don't think you want to think, I don't want you to think about Wi-Fi anymore. I just yeah. think that it should be an inherent thing. We know that internet connectivity by the UN, the Broadband Commission 2021, said that the, that universal access to the internet is a human right, 
right? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to bring that to fruition. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to think about Wi-Fi anymore. We're in 2023, man. Like, why are we still talking about Wi-Fi? <laughs> this has been around yeah, yeah. for 15 plus years. No one's connected all the Wi-Fi. There's not one network underneath it. And guess what? This network is vast and it's and it's valuable. There's 6.5 billion, sorry, <clears throat> math, $3.5 trillion worth of Wi-Fi in the world, the infrastructure wow. of Wi-Fi, trillion yeah. with a T. There's enough pie for me and everybody else in there. I don't have to go through and, and you know, try to be the next Elon Musk and, and the next Jeff Bezos and and try to like steal people's data and, and make all this money, man. Like we, we got enough. I think yeah. millennials and Gen Z from traveling and talking with people, we inherently are like, you know, we got enough. We can share. Let's make the experience better for everybody. And my mm -hmm. little slice of this pie is like, let me make you never think about the Wi-Fi asking for it again. That's in five years. And I hope that we build out the Wi-Fi to be useful. More more than what it is right now. So like, you know, it's Wi Fi everywhere, right? That's we we I say this a lot and my, my co founder says this and people that I've met while traveling, I say Wi Fi everywhere. And yeah. they're like, What? And I'm like, Wi Fi is you can't defy physics. It's better than satellite, right? It just is better than satellite. And if you're indoors, like there's no way that five G can out, can be better. It's impossible. Mm. Wi Fi is the best. Um, we should be enhancing that experience. And the reason why we have and the reason why you haven't seen Wi-Fi everywhere and the reason why you don't have an automation app is that, well, one, it wasn't possible to make this kind of app a few years ago. Um, it still is on the cusp of not possible, but we can do it. Um, it just takes okay. belief in hard work and sweat equity. Um, number two is that the internet is kind of owned by a bunch of different people. Right. And this is why the biggest companies in the world are chasing after, um, you know, Elon Musk is making Starlink and mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos is making something called the Cooper Network. Um, mm -hmm. And they're trying to own the network that everyone uses. They want to because they realize yeah. that the Internet is the most probably the singularly the most important resource we have on Earth. Um, yeah. So. All I'm trying to do is just say, OK, guys, I don't want one person to own one network. We have a, other visions for Verify that I can't get into right now because we want investors and I don't want to have to say things publicly that investors are like, I don't want to defend that. But like we have an idea behind um, Verify that, you know, we want to disperse this network so that people have built the network and own the network. And, you know, we talked previously about my ideas behind crypto and yeah company and stuff right like i do have altruistic views behind this and how verify can can become a company that one our model is built off of like a proof of work model how ethereum works and how mining works is like people that add wi-fi's and people that validate wi-fi's those are like you know little miners and validators you know the same way how ethereum nodes work and it's not obviously blockchain but um i'm very much influenced by you know decentralization and I think that we have to just have certain forms and certain things happen in society, like free access to Wi-Fi and free access to the internet um, to innovate and to act in certain ways. And I hope that Verify helps bring forth a better reality for people and one that's connecting people and giving them connectivity as they want to be a global citizen and as they want to travel and be a person of the world. No, it sounds super interesting. And I'm curious your feedback, like uh, if that proof of work or that decentralized model for Verify would at all be similar to Helium. I mean, that's something I heard of. I actually have a Helium miner myself, uh, but obviously <laughs> that has like gone. That that, no, obviously it's gone to <laughs> shit, uh, but, you know, I still have it in my uh, spare bedroom over here. I think it's still mining. I don't know. I haven't checked anymore, but. It's an interesting concept, yeah. but so maybe just some feedback on that. And where's my phone? I wanted to read you something, actually. Uh, okay. You can go Ooh. grab it if you want. If it's no, close. I got it right here. Um, let me read you the Reddit on Helium. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Listen, I don't want to openly be talking shit on Helium, but I'm just going to read you from the Helium uh, subreddits. Here it is. Helium voting system is a farce. One wallet, 77.5% of the vote, two hours before the deadline, question mark. Um, the community opinion is irrelevant if you can just buy yourself the vote for look, for locking up 31 uh, million um, over four years. So basically, they're saying that HIP 83 is theft and is disguised as mm technical necessity um mm -hmm. but what they're saying is, is that this is not a decentralized network number one number mm -hmm. two they're saying that you can buy like in a decentralized autonomous organization a dao um they're claiming that you can buy um like the vote right like you can just buy yeah. it where helium where where um helium's going so that it's mm -hmm. not really decentralized um so if you want to make a dao and you want to make a decentralized autonomous organization um, there has to be a lot of mechanisms in there, a lot of governance, right, that gets in there. And you have the right community and you got to pull the trigger and go to a Web3, right, um, a blockchain solution. You got to transfer that at the right time. So if Verify wants to become a blockchain solution, if it wants to become a crypto company in the future, right, where people's, we will do this. This is what I will say. This is already on our white paper. We've said this out loud. Um, every time you add a Wi-Fi, right, you get points in Verify. We call mm -hmm. them very points. These yeah. very points will turn into our token one day. So every person that adds a Wi-Fi and that validates a Wi-Fi are earning points. Now we've gamified it. We're going to have achievements for adding Wi-Fi's. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they're really fun too. Like I've, I've probably come up with like a hundred different achievements and things like there's also secret ones and stuff that, you know, if someone ends up watching this podcast, like way in the future and they're like, there's secret ones. Cause I don't think you're going to yeah. find them out. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm open no, to talk cool. about it. But like we're going to have like secret achievements, right. Where like, you know, you, you, you've gone to like certain places, um, and you've unlocked certain things. So we're going to gamify the experience. Um. We're going to have bounty programs. So like we're going to put bounties on like when we have like a thousand users in a city and people, there's a leaderboard that shows that like Connor Deck is like number one contributor to the network in yeah. Medellin or in, you know, San Jose or wherever, right? It'll show that you're the top contributor. It's going to show the leaderboard. It's going to show how many points you have. And what we want to do is we want to build a network built by the people. And Helium has the term, a network, I think a people's network or something, right? Yeah, but they ask you to buy like four hundred dollar miners and to sink like millions and millions of dollars into something that they're now paying T-Mobile to provide connectivity. They mm. are paying T-Mobile. Helium's paying T-Mobile to be associated with the team with the T-Mobile network, right? Like they they aren't a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, their token yeah. has sunk the bed, right? It's it's it shit itself. Um, they don't provide a better connectivity than 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 the current providers and they're doing something that's massive and they require a lot of capital up front. We're using existing infrastructure and saying, Hey, sure. like, we'll cover gaps and we'll gamify it. And when you add in, when you contribute as a, a user of our network, we want to show that your contribution has value by giving you these points that one day will turn into our currency. But before we ever go web three, before we ever turn that into a currency, we're going to have sinks and faucets ways a faucet turns on how you make the token where the token comes from and the sink is like where it goes into right like how do you spend it how do you use it um what's the value behind it right like imagine if like you were a provider and you know we as a network decided hey we're going to build an optimization plan for wi-fi connectivity for athens greece mm -hmm. right it's a 30 million dollar project and then all of a sudden we distribute 15 million or 20 million or 25 million of that money in US dollar coin or some token to the users that have built the network. Like yeah. we're distributing funds that we make um, because we're able to utilize and build a network by the people. There's a lot of ways we can do this, right? And this is like kind of the, the further goal. Like this is like the two year, three year mark for me. Um, what I want to get to, what I'm dreaming mm. of. Um, Cause I love crypto and I love blockchain solutions. Yeah. And I, I, I love, I love web three in general and you know, we had talked before. I was running a a Twitch channel where I had thousand plus, um, you know, subscribers, and 
and followers and stuff. And, and, you know, I was like racing digital racehorses and stuff. Like and mm-hmm. I was making thousands of dollars just racing digital racehorses. And, and that community and my Twitter profile and everybody will, will say, I've ne- I did nothing wrong. I, I never rugged anyone. Um, I lost a lot of money actually. Um, all that money I made um, racing and betting on crypto horses. I, I sat for the rug pull by the fucking company that rug pulled me. Um, <laughs> I like yeah. I was a I was a a Twitch streamer and uh, we got rugged by the company all together and then we kept playing the game because it was fun. Um, but like sure. I've been in crypto for a long time, and uh, we do have aims and, and aspirations for Verify um, to use the the already growing and expansive <laughs> world of of um, crypto uh, currency and crypto technologies. So yeah. I, I really think that there's some innovative solutions coming out and, you know, clearly Bitcoin isn't going away. And Ethereum is, I think, the, the a, a solution to our modern economic system. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty bullish on it. And I hope to build my company underneath it um, in the future. No, I think that'd be super cool if you were able to pull it off. I'm curious, like you talked about the helium token just tanking. How would you prevent a verify token, whatever it's called in the future from doing that? How do you create a sustainable token that holds its value in relation to a, a fiat currency, right? Because it's not, if your token was like the helium token is today, obviously I've just stopped paying attention to my miner and everything in general. Obviously you want to keep people involved and engaged. I just, how do you do that? All right. I don't think anyone's ever asked me it that way um okay so number one i'd I'd have participation in the network would be easy right like i know that participating for your helium miner has a really hard capital investment of 400 bucks for the miner itself yeah true like for you to participate in the helium miner um in the helium network in general that's that's a hard ask of an investor that's there's a lot of a story that has to go behind that ask for 400 bucks right like this is the future of the world we're building the next internet right um cool um awesome mm-hmm. well there's a three trillion dollar network that already exists called wi-fi and we can, oh, yeah. we can it. so i ask very minimal uh, our network asks for hey like can you add a password mm-hmm. um if you have the app in the background and you connect to it you've now contributed like yeah Participation in the network is, is, is low risk, minimum participation is needed, right? Um, for validation, like for node validation, for proving that that Wi-Fi does exist, it does work, and it's still on. Because Wi-Fis can turn off, by the way, and they can like mm-hmm. change the password, right? So we can yeah. know like pretty pretty frequently when that's happening and how to mitigate it. And that's one of the problems I think that other solutions for Wi-Fi have missed. But how do you stop the token from tanking? Well. You have to ensure that there's enough places to put the token, and the token has value. Like if I just tell you, there's a guy named NFT God on Twitter, and he's a cool guy. I like mm-hmm. his takes on things. He said, if you see bored apes, these are just pictures of monkeys. Now, it, the, the the application of the bored ape, right? Like I can go to cool parties um, at the BTC um, in 2021, the BTC Miami, I think, 2020. Um, having a board ape got you into a really sick party, and that kind of like moved a lot of people's lips about board apes. And then board apes started really pumping hard after Bitcoin Miami 2020. Um, mm-hmm. Right, like it's a status symbol. Um, it's yeah. a part of a community, right? Like that's it. Like really, board apes. That's it. Like you, you're cool, and you have a nice Louis Vuitton bag. That there's only ten thousand of, right? You got an Hermes bag that's ten thousand. There's only ten thousand of them, right? Like, and I can recognize that you have that, and it's a status symbol. And then what that community does and what the access allows you by the NFT token is where all the value behind a board ape is. Um, all the games and bullshit that I'm looking at, man, I've been around this. I've been in this since day one. I was in board apes since day fucking one yeah. watching them. I liked my pretty ponies way more than board apes, by the way. <laughs> I can race the damn ponies, man. Zed That's Run true. was before Zed Run was before I got into Zed Run before board apes. Um, it was like March 2020. Um, and I remember my friend, uh, she's, I actually don't, yeah, I can say it. Uh, my friend, Tiffany Fong, um, she's like a big time crypto gal. And I remember she and I were talking about this stuff in like June, 2020. Um, and she 
was like, should I buy NFTs or whatever else? And and I had made like a portfolio of like you should maybe buy Bored Ape. Um, and back then, like uh, we no one really could conceptualize like what this was, like a Bored Ape or or yeah. buying uh, certain NFTs, CryptoPunks and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, like she had a decent amount of like ETH and Bitcoin. She ended up putting it into Celsius, and then it rugged on her, and then she became famous because of it because she was like, oh, I lost all my money in Celsius. And the guy, Alex Mashinsky, who did the rug, by the way, he went to jail, I think, today or yesterday. He got arrested. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah so big dub for my girl, Tiffany, if she's watching. There you go. Um, so anyways, all of this to be said, because I'm getting on a big tangent, but all of this to be said, man, you need to have value behind the token. And we can't say that it's the future and you can't say that it's coming and you can't be like, we're going to build cool video games like Bored Apes um, or this is a status symbol. Like if I make a token and I give it to my users, I want it to have an immediate use. And mm -hmm. then I know a lot of people are going to dump it and a lot of people are going to sell a token, right? But if that token can result in you making money, you voting on the future of it, um, you're able to like, I mean, we could use it as an, an in-app thing. Like if you want to be a company and you want to promote like your company on my app, you got to pay X amount of token for it. So mm -hmm. like if I force companies to, to have to buy token, sorry if there's noise in the background, but no, if yeah, I good. have to have a company, buy, you're good. Um, if, I, if I have a company that wants to promote themselves on my app, right? And they have to buy the token, that token is inevitably burnt, right? To promote yeah. themselves limit the amount of times that you can promote your company right so like you can't just like spam it bro like i don't want to see the same company promoting themselves right but you can build in-app syncs and i actually um this is something that i did in crypto a little bit was like this consulting on tokens um tokenomics and and like how to build use cases and i was really trying to do it for this horse company um the zed run the racing guys um and it was just a little too late before they realized that the the streamers and the guys that were and the girls and guys um that were doing their um social media and engagement i had 25 percent at one point i had 25 percent of the active users watching my channel right we the users will drive what they want to see with your product right like mm -hmm. that's just that's a classic you know business model like users will tell you what they want um follow what the users want pretty simple um and i think that with zed run and a lot of crypto they don't listen to the users and they have actually no way to a b test the users they don't know like what do the users actually want i don't yeah. really know how a lot of companies gauge that and i don't think that it's correct when they do gauge it and so your token needs to have real use cases um it's value and it has to be valuable and it has to represent something and you know there has to be a benefit to the user because i want people to feel like they they built the network they should also you know have the spoils of war from the networks you know production and what it does and and its profitability and like investors might cringe from that idea and they're like oh all the money's ours but it's like hey like the best things that have ever been made I think this was a Michael Siebel or Seibel um, from Y Combinator. He did a video on YouTube, and I think I don't forget who's the guy with them, but they said like the best products that are made give a lot of value up front, mm -hmm. and they're cheap, they're affordable, and they give a lot of value up front. Their value proposition is huge, and it's good for people to use. Google Ads, for example, I think they used. They said Google Ads allowed for companies. It was really cheap in the beginning, and it allowed you to get your product in front of a lot of people, right? Yeah. That was huge, right? That, that's why Google Ads did really well. Um, simple product, get your stuff in front of a bunch of people. Google wasn't winning money out the teeth, out the ass, right? They, I mean, they just knew that a lot of people were going to use it. Yeah. So 100%. that's what I think. If we deliver something that has a lot of value, a lot of promise, a lot of purpose, um, and it's built by them and they're able to be represented that that's a company that I think will last. And I think other companies, um, are far too greedy and then they build crypto and things and they use buzzwords and they're not well educated on it and they haven't been through the bear and the bull cycle. They showed up for the bull. And like, I don't think a lot of people have struggled and have lived many, many, many years um through you know the cycles of crypto the cycles of this business and i think that when you look at some of the best investors like y Combinator, i think is a really good in, in, in uh, incubator and investment um group in general 
they, mm-hmm. they, they were like, you need to have a minimum of X amount of years in this field. You know, you need to have yeah. experience. <laughs> and that's what I think that, you know, when it comes to a crypto and a token, you know, we're not here for the bull cycle. I'm not here for, um, to make a bunch of money off everybody. I want to create an, an app that provides connectivity to people that's built by the people and that represents them and their and their share of adding and creating a network and how cool is it to be somebody that you're traveling and you're like, yeah, I, I, I was a, I helped build this network with this app um, yeah. and then this token and like, Hey, I made like a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks. Who knows how much token, you know, based on my contributions um, going forward. And, and this is helping build free internet for people, you know, that I don't know. It's a lot. It's a lot. That's my five year. You asked to, there's a lot of stuff in that. And yeah, uh, no, I think that's super cool. Uh, maybe we can kind of end with like your overall view of crypto. Cause I know I asked you earlier if you're bullish long-term on crypto and one other question I want to ask you, you said you're a big fan of Ethereum. Does that mean you're going to build when you get to this point, verify on the Ethereum network? Okay. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> that's okay. a, yeah, I'm a big fan of crypto. Um, I gave you my breakdown, and there's so many people out there, so many guys out there who are like, oh, I know what's going to happen with crypto. But like, I've been pretty much right since I found Bitcoin since 2012, 2013. Um, don't, I can probably say, we'll just say I got into crypto young and early. Um, mm-hmm. And we'll just say that like, it was a form of how I would buy weed um, in 2012, 2013, right? Um, okay. Yeah. I, right? Like, we knew about it because, like, you could buy weed with this one guy at my school um, through it. And, you know, like, we, we, we kind of played with the idea of Bitcoin. It was like $2.50 since I first heard of it. And I think it was 8 bucks when I got involved with Bitcoin. Damn. Um, and I didn't keep it. Um, I actually have like an 80. Unfortunately, Bitcoin. right? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. My mom, yeah. she knows. There's like 80 Bitcoin on like, I have 80 Bitcoin and we lost where, where it was. It was stored. Um, it was on a wallet and it was uh, it was lost at the time. Um, and that is somewhere in a backpack that my mom had from my school, but she loves giving stuff away to um, the foundation, not foundation army. What is it called? Uh, like um, Salvation Army. Yeah, Salvation Army. Yeah. We donate stuff, right? She's like, here's a backpack and all of his calculators and stuff and flash drives and, and you know, blah, 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 blah. It's all in this, you know, <laughs> and she just gave it away. There's 80 Bitcoin in that backpack. And uh, I'm a, So I'm a someone set. out there found it. Like, like is it on a, a thumb drive kind of or like? Yeah, I've, I mean, also, it's not like it didn't stick with me long. Um, they were like in my company in my freshman year and they were like, Ian's so scammy he keeps talking about bitcoin we're gonna get rich i was trying to get a minor man i was like 2013 my dad like i was like I need five grand i'm gonna buy this like it minor thing i'm gonna mine bitcoin i'm like trying to mine on my laptop like and at west point and i'm like i'm gonna plug it in the server room and like there's actually like a, a place they kept meat and stuff like it was like, really cold and they like kept servers in there or something i don't know mm-hmm. i was just gonna plug it in there and like yeah. i didn't know much about computers back then at all i probably don't know much about computers now but i was like i'm gonna like <laughs> take this bitcoin miner and like stick it in this little room it's gonna mine bitcoin and uh yeah so that didn't happen i didn't get five thousand bucks from my dad for it i would have made millions hundreds of millions of dollars um i had a buddy of yeah. mine named jake who wanted to drop out of west point with me he actually believed in me he wanted to make a bitcoin mining farm with me it would cost us about 50 grand to get 10 of them. We had a place we were going to rent out in Delaware where he was from. And we ended up not doing it. He did drop out of West Point, but I don't. I never asked him if he made the Bitcoin farm because we were really dead set on it. Fast forward later, I get back in the Bitcoin and I actually get into Ethereum. Um, I buy a bunch of Ethereum 2018 um, and I hold on to it and I sell it about eight months later, I think for a decent amount of money. Um, mm-hmm. And I traveled to Australia in 2019 with the money that I, if I would have just held, man. <laughs> if I would have yeah. just held. Yeah, man. Right? It's crazy. 
it kept it kept doing that. So I kept coming in and out of crypto. Um, twenty twenty, I came in for longer. Um, got into Zed Run. Got into learning what exactly you know this is, and I believe that what we're seeing now is you know Larry Fink of BlackRock just came out and said um, Bitcoin is the gold. The digital is digital gold, and we've all mm-hmm. known that. Um, Right. There's uh, a lot of people I've been watching and following for a while that know that Bitcoin's digital gold. Why does this matter? Well, Larry Fink controls nine trillion dollars. Um, yeah. <laughs> so right. like this guy saying it's digital gold is like, OK, so probably this is going to be a reserve asset in some regard. So I think you're going to see a lot of um, pensions going into this because BlackRock, I think like the teacher's pension is. Um, sorry. I think there's like a teacher's pension, a bunch of other stuff, um, right? They can just slide into Bitcoin immediately. All the pensions and like you're going to start seeing lots of money flood into Bitcoin. But I think Bitcoin's a lot harder to build on, a lot harder to yeah. build upon. So mm-hmm. I now you have to look at there's BRICS, India, China, Russia, right? I was in Brazil when they traded in their euros for Chinese one. Like they mm-hmm. traded in their euros. Like that was like the, their second reserve currency was the euro. Um, we're watching a world that's China, Russia, India. They're like, we're gonna make a gold backed currency. And you're like, okay, we yeah. tried that once. And like FDR, I think, went away from it, right? We went with a yeah. credit back system and we dropped gold in general. Um, but the same way that we say that a dollar is backed by gold. We're gonna say a dollar is backed by the Bitcoin. And I think the U.S. government, if they're smart they would back their currency with Bitcoin, right? And then we mm-hmm. would utilize the same way how the dollar is, a digital currency that was backed by Bitcoin, right? And mm-hmm. they would trade what the dollar does now. Now it's not gonna be yeah. a dollar, it's not gonna be one dollar, right? Like it's not gonna look like that. I don't think the dollar is gonna survive as it currently is. But then you look at, okay, well, what's going to be the thing that you can build upon that is immutable technology that is, that's, that's crypto, blockchain technology, right? That has yeah. the innovative structure of this. That's Ethereum. Mm-hmm. It's inherently Ethereum. I mean, and people are like, oh, transaction fees are really exp-. Then I know when someone says transaction fees in Ethereum are expensive, I know that they're an idiot. But I shouldn't say it like that because that's me. I know that they don't know a lot about Ethereum. There's something called Layer 2. And this has been around since, like, I think when I first got in the crypto hardcore in 2020, they made layer the first layer twos. And this was a side chain at the time was Polygon. But, like, there's, like, yeah. one set of transactions. If you had a brain, if you use a credit card, there's a 2.5% transaction fee already attached to a credit card. There's a 30% minimum that, like, gets taxed by the credit card company for using the credit card. Yeah. Like, what's the, like, okay... But Ethereum can do a million transactions on layer two for cents, for cents, mm-hmm. yeah. way less than 30 cents, way less than a 2.5% tax on the profit to whatever company is doing it, right? So, and they can take a million transactions and, and they can put it into one, right? Um, I forget, it's, it's um, modular scalability, right? They can take something at layer one, which is the consensus, right? Where they agree upon, like that transactions are happening, that they're real. There's consensus at layer one. The execution of it can be modularly scaled, right? And put to layer two, where like all the computational power needs to happen for a sense, and then bring it back down to layer one. And then it's a transaction's complete and it's way cheaper. We can build upon that kind of technology, and that's what Ethereum is. And like, yeah, it's already sound money. It's already sound money. It already moves way faster than the dollar does, in any sort of electronic currency. And it can, and it can just be built upon and scale much better, <clears throat> more efficiently. And so, I think the speed of money is what gives Ethereum an edge: is that it can move fast. And the faster money moves, the better money is. And that's really how economies work is the more circulity of funding and the more circulating money, the better it is. So, I mean, that's kind of a bastardized version of how I would look at Ethereum. Um, but I really, I really am a big fan. Yeah, no, I think that's super interesting. I think one of the biggest roadblocks to crypto currently, right? Like, so let's say you want to pay somebody in Ethereum or Polygon, like you talked about, is if you, let's just say you send it to someone in Colombia, 
I mean, it's my understanding they're not going to know a lot about it. There's no way for them to turn it into their native fiat currency. So I think that is a big roadblock, right? Is It's super easy to get it to them if they understand it, they have a wallet, and you could just send it immediately as opposed to trying like wire money internationally or something. But what do you do with it when you have it? You know, right at this point in time, you have to turn it into U.S. dollar, for example, and that could be cumbersome sometimes. Sure. I mean, think about Verify. Why, if, if we are interacting with businesses all the time, all the Wi-Fis, right? We know we are literally mapping all the commercial Wi-Fi locations. What if we just plug the wallet into your to the app and you're able to use mm -hmm. these fiat cur these currencies as fiat immediately? Yeah on entering their business they know who you are they know that this is related to some sort of real phone they don't know that like connor deck has walked in right they don't know yeah that. but they know that like it's a real phone it's a real wallet and you're in their location and you're able to pay and like legally speaking like there it's gonna be a backed up transaction that you actually spent that money um we're verifying that you're actually in that location spending that money if we connected a wallet to the app so like verify could That's also right. be a way to verify um what you're doing and how you're spending money and, and that you're real and that like it can be a um a point of it could be part of a point of sale where like people are selling and you can use the app to also purchase and you know i i think the reason why crypto hasn't been adopted the thing that i'm trying to solve and hopefully verify one day can solve and help solve is that it's just really complicated to have like tell you like all the ins and outs of like blockchain technology and you'd be like oh i'm gonna use it now like yeah. you're like this it's it's like an investment right now it's not like you're not there's a guy named ryan sean adams and i love him he's amazing <laughs> um he okay. just shouted me on twitter a while ago and i was really proud of it because i follow their channel called bankless all the time and he made a tweet where he was like, I'm going to start selling people and like, Ven I think it was Venmo. I'm going to start Venmoing people in crypto. Cause like, if we're going to pay, you can pay in, in crypto. And then apparently Venmo sent him like five bucks being like, you can already pay in crypto with Venmo. You're like, what? You can pay in crypto with yeah. Venmo? Like, right. Like obviously paying in Ethereum is difficult because like it shifts in price all the time. But when you can pay in us dollar coin, USDC, US dollar, yeah. dollar USDT, like, it's a pretty simple, easy form of payment. And you just have to transfer your real money right now into crypto. But going forward, people could get paid in crypto, could get paid in US dollar coin, could get paid in a, in a yeah. currency. Tap, and tap that's, to pay with USDC. Be yeah. good. Imagine here, here, look, here's the here's how I solved the Columbia thing, right? And this can, we can end on this. Yeah. You are a Colombian citizen. Uh, you're a software developer for me. I paid you in Ethereum, right? Mm -hmm. So I just paid you in ETH. And you're like, great, I just got paid a thousand bucks in ETH. You then can just go and if you if this is the future, right? And there's a there's a way to pay like Apple Pay, right? And you walk up to pay with Apple Pay and you have Ethereum. And that user, that guy only accepts US dollar coin. There could be a swap function from twenty-five dollars in that exact real time. That twenty-five dollars you want to spend on for dinner would swap from twenty-five dollars in ETH immediately over to us dollar coin and then would shift and be paid to the guy um and you could pay right then and there for your dinner as apple pay does and yeah that can seem seamlessly happen a uniswap or a swap function would occur um for the amount that you want in eth to us dollar coin or the the vendor can accept eth as well because yeah. apparently there's there's value for accepting eth because it could go up could go down if you're a fan of ethereum you only care that one ETH is one ETH. You don't care about how much money that ETH is, right? Like everyone in crypto says one ETH equals one ETH for a reason. Like we don't care if it's $4,000. We don't care if it's $2,000. We like it when it's 4,000. We don't like it when it's 2,000. But like we do want more of the ETH, right? That's the mm -hmm. idea. So you could just trade right then and there with the phone. So that's the future is crypto in my opinion. And it's bright. And we're pioneers yeah. going out west. That's an old way they say on Bankless. A bunch of pioneers <laughs> going out west. No, I think it's super interesting. And yeah, I appreciate you giving me insight, your business and your college career and how kind of that influenced to where you are today. But yeah, why don't we just end? I'll give you the floor. Where can people find you? Where can they find Verify once it's up and running? Any any last words? Yeah, of course. So you can find me on Instagram. <laughs> 
uh ian connor 94 uh that's my insta i have an open instagram i like to post my travels and stuff i love interacting with people on there um you can find me on twitter at d'artanian d-a-r-t-a-n-i-a-n dot eth um so that's my that is my um, ethereum name but also on twitter um and then you can find verify at verify v-e-r-i-f-i dot world um that is our website and we'll be soon verify the erifi on the app store and google play by the time you watch this video we'll be on the app store and you can start to add wi-fi's and pioneer out west and and bring wi-fi everywhere with us awesome yeah i'm looking forward to it i'll definitely download it check it out but hey man thanks for taking the time and best of luck and meta inc and getting everything off the ground hey thank you connor for having me on yeah all right